Thank you. We're thrilled to have musician Rosie Flores <laughs> and muralist Fabian Deborah with us. So Rosie is a singer, songwriter, and guitarist in rock and country music and has been influenced by everyone from Bob Willis to um, Eva Ibarra. Fabian Debora, sorry, it's hard to go back from English to Spanish pronunciation, <laughs> is a muralist whose work distills a wide range of experiences particular to the Chicano community, as well as his own personal experience of incarceration. So we have a brief film about each panelist to give you a better sense of their work, and then after we'll be interviewing one another and having a great conversation, I hope. Um, thank you so much. Art is a powerful tool. It can make you or it could break you. Growing up as a Mexican American, you come to learn that somehow you're not Mexican enough, but you're also not American enough. So for me, the Chicano mural movement, it's about the whole picture. We paint the truth. As a kid, I remember walking around the city of Boyle Heights. That's when I start to see these large scale murals. And I would just stare and get lost within these walls. And that was the introduction to the Chicano mural movement. So what I do is I paint it in increments. You know, I paint layer one, layer two, layer three, until I get to the top. This is fun. I grew up in the projects. It was very rough. When I start to lose my father to the violence, drugs, and addiction, disturbances would take place in my household. But I remember I would go and hide under my coffee table, pick up my notebook, and I would begin to create my own worlds to escape my reality. For me, art was my refuge. In Los Angeles, in the 80s, the gangs were at their highest peak. It was very difficult for a teenage boy to grow in these environments. And when you're hopeless, you fall for anything. I joined the gang at the age of 12. It was the worst mistake I ever made. My life flipped upside down. I was stuck in a revolving door of suffering and pain, in and out of incarceration from juvenile hall to adult prisons. See the pain again, trying to free himself. When I was in jail, I would just keep trying. In 1994, I was only 17 years old. They wanted to give me three years in youth authority. Father Greg Boyle, the founder of Homeboy Industries, shared to the judge that I do have a talent. They said, okay, find him a location. I didn't know what to expect. I walk into this beautiful studio. I was like, what? Why are you been all my life? Those murals that I saw as a kid, now I'm in the house of the master painters. The East Low Streetscapers are the pioneers, Chicano murals. And they embraced me. Regardless if I was a gang member, they saw me for me and my gift of art. I made a decision to just start creating bodies of work. Murals are a portal, a window into dimensions of knowledge and wisdom and struggle and story. And we have to make sure that we transmit this, pass it down. In 2008, I decided to build a school. I wanted to pay it forward. And so here we are now at the Homeboy Art Academy. The youth that I work with, they're already actively involved in gangs. 
It provides a place where they can begin to redefine their lives. All right, we're gonna go ahead and start winding it down. We're gonna start bringing ourselves to the center of the circle. Uh, we're gonna do a quick check-in as we usually do. I can relate and I see myself a lot in them. You're in the right place. You're exactly where you need to be. Allow us to hold you. I just turned 18 and before the academy was just in and out of juvenile hall, or gang, you know, a lot of gang violence. It's been about a year that I've been out. My life has done a drastic 360. Like, I don't have that father figure, and he is that father figure to a lot of people, for sure. So don't be ashamed of your past. Embrace your past. The past is actually good to revisit at times for the lessons learned. So. I didn't know I knew how to draw until I came here. I just started putting everything that I was putting into something else, and I just started drawing. I feel like I didn't have it in me, but I did. I just needed to, like, be around people that I, like, I want to change, you know? All right, y'all, thank you. The higher the number on the H, the lighter. Is, Not right? often do you see artworks reflective of the people in our community. You see the Renaissance, Baroque, but they don't reflect me. Why I focus on portraiture is because if I'm advocating for the people in my community and I'm painting images that reflect them, they feel seen and recognize that we are valuable. And that is what Chicano art is. Paint what you see. Paint what you feel. And everything else will fall in place. I've been doing this my whole life. The music bug has been there since I came out of the womb. <laughs> I think I probably, my first cry probably had a melody to it. <laughs> this cat's in the dog house. This cat's in the dog house. This cat's in the dog house. Never gonna let him out. I was born in San Antonio in 1950. Then we moved to San Diego when I was 11. I started learning guitar when I was 16. 16 to 74 is how long I've been a musician in a band. I chose music as part of my life because it was feeding my creative side and it was something that I was passionate about. And I saw bands on TV, I saw jazz singers in black and white, you know, in the 50s. And I was just enamored watching somebody like Peggy Lee sing or Julie London, Ella Fitzgerald. And I was just, wow, look at how amazing these women are that sing. And I wondered if, if I could ever do that. I started going up to L.A. and playing the Troubadour in Hollywood, which I ended up moving to L.A. because there were so many opportunities, because I went as far as I could in the San Diego area. I started hanging out in the Palomino country scene and started doing the talent contest every week. Six months later, I started winning. It was like, oh, people like what I do. I'll keep going. When I was starting to play at the Palomino Club, I was doing a lot of rockabilly back then and had my little white cowboy boots and my sparkly cowboy shirts. And I dressed a little more like 50s country and then a lot of fringe. And I would do, you know, songs by the Collins Kids or Elvis Presley or Janice Martin and Wanda Jackson. So they started calling me the Rockabilly Philly. And so when I, I did that album, I titled it the Rockabilly Philly. I just wanted to play the troubadour and play in real places. I wanted to hit the big time. I wanted to be around people like John Prine and 
Bonnie Raitt and Linda Ronstadt, the Eagles. I wanted to be around those people. Those were professionals. So I ended up opening for a bunch of those people. I lived in Nashville, Los Angeles, and I always keep coming back to Texas. When I came back, Austin, Texas just threw its arms around me and said, welcome back. Through the years, I've been influenced by so many different kinds of music, from jazz to blues, rockabilly, country. I believe, though, that those genres have a thread, which are the American roots music. The different genres helped shape the kind of music that I do now. I think that's why I have different passions for different sounds, and I'm just not satisfied at being just a country artist with a twang with three chords, or just a rockabilly artist. It's great to be here at Seabury's Heart and Soul. The heart of Austin, Texas, y'all. Black lines on my paper Sad words on my mind From tears that fall down One straight Performing live is just a real jolt for me. I connect with my audience. I look into their eyes and I sing to them. I like to put joy in people's hearts with live music. But the real reason that I've been there this whole time is because I'm so passionate about it and it feeds me and it makes me feel good. I like to think that my music would be carried on and that, you know, other generations would find a song that I wrote or a style that I had that influenced them and you know, much in the way that I was moved by Peggy Lee and Julie London and how I was moved by the guitar stylings of Jeff Beck. You know, these people that aren't here anymore. Your childhood memory. I'd like to carry on their tradition and, and what they've started. And I would, I would love to you look down from heaven one day and say, wow, that girl sounds like me. She's doing what I used to do. I got the chills. <laughs> oh, middle. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. Um, those films were beautiful. I think we got a sense of who you are, but also how important this work is to you. Um, your work, your lives, I don't know. <laughs> I do want to say that um, the NEA National Heritage Fellowship um, is the highest honor in the nation given to reflect your excellence in folk and traditional arts. And so we're so honored to have you here and to speak about you know, what brought you to this, uh, to the, this moment in your life. Um, how did you begin your respective journeys to becoming the artist that you are today? Like, what fed you to, and what drove you to this level of mastery? Shall I answer that one? Yeah. Uh, what, what drove me to this level of getting an NEA award <laughs> is that I've just been doing what I've loved since I was a kid. Uh, my dad started recording me when I was six years old. And I have some of those recordings. You can hear one on the Rockabilly Philly CD. It's a, as a bonus track. And I just had so much joy from singing. Um, it just was a way to express myself. And I learned to get confidence from it. And just the joy of doing something that, something that you love. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I went on to playing in a band. and writing songs and, you know, just doing whatever I could to be musical, artistic. I was drawing, I was doing tap dancing, you know, whatever I could do that was an artistic endeavor. And I, that's, I just 
am doing the same thing right now that I've always done. So I guess if you keep doing something long enough, you'll end up here. <laughs> Somebody will appreciate you eventually. <laughs> um, yeah, same, same for you. Well, I think um, it's the same thing. Uh, there's some commonalities. I think, you know, for me, I was blessed and lucky to have discovered this gift of art at a very young age. But a lot of it had to stem from the fact that your loss of identity, you know, when you're growing up in uh, Los Angeles, or at least when you come from immigrant parents, you're kind of lost for identity, trying to search and find some anchors that can really give you that sense of existence. And to me, it began in that, in that moment, because as we're trying to figure something out, art was the one that was holding me during that time. Uh, but it wasn't until then uh, when I started to become more exposed to the arts, such as the East Low Streetscapers that I talk so highly about in the film. Uh, Wayne Healy and David Botteo, they're the ones who really introduced me to what it is my culture, mi cultura, my history. When we start to think about the, what happened to us, you know, from Hernán Cortés to La Malinche to uh, mm -hmm. all, those, all those historical uh, things that shaped us as a uh, Folks, then that's when things start to really ignite in me. But at the same time, um, taking some of that and, uh, and recognizing what was taking place in my environments and trying to redefine identity, uh, to me, it's how I start to really cultivate this, this sense of uh, my own personal path in this Chicano mo movement, right? And I think that's where it was. And also just staying consistent is true, is key, but also trying hard to amplify the voices of those who go unheard of or who are continuously made outcasts. And I think that's what amplifies me and gives me the drive to really keep going to be exactly where I am today, to receive the NEA. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think um, what really struck me uh, yesterday was the award ceremony for anyone who was not able to attend. Um, you both mentioned the communities that helped uplift you. Either in a time of need, you said your father bought you instruments and said, get to work, girls, you know, and your, and your, your family seems to be integral to this. Um, and art kind of came at a time in your life that, that changed your trajectory. Um, I think, can we talk a little bit about the communities that not only you grew up in and were part of, but the ones that you've also created? Like, you've been in a band for, you said, since you were 16, and you've come up with such you know, other amazing artists and, and you helped define a genre. And you are now you know, helping so many youth and, and homeboy um, art academy. So, so can we talk about, yeah, where the communities it came from, but also the ones you've created? Well, the communities that I've worked with in Los Angeles, Nashville, and Austin have been very you know, there's been a lot of camaraderie between other musicians, men and women. I've had I've worked with quite a few women musicians, uh, but I've also worked with a lot of male musicians, and it just it feels like you know, like the camaraderie we had with all the NEA winners that we just felt like a family in the last two days. The music scenes of the Roots music that I've been part of really feel like a family like that. And, you know, I'm wearing the Palomino uh, t-shirt because this club in North Hollywood was where a lot of us, you know, country rockabilly musicians used to hang out and we all got to know each other and it was like, it was like a big club, you know, and it was almost like we were gang members together, you know. <laughs> we were just like, we held each other up and we were there for each other. When it was somebody's birthday, would make a big deal, and um, having that kind of family, familia, with all diverse uh, people, you know, all races, you know, Chicano, um, we had Asian, we had, you know, German people, just all kinds of people, because LA is such a uh, a melting pot of different people, and to be able to make friends with all these different people, you know, African-American, and be one big family was pretty special. Mm -hmm. And we're still friends, all of these same people, after all these years. That's amazing. Yeah, it's been really cool. 
Um, for me, I think um, when you think about Los Angeles, I think uh, there's a lot of layers, right? And in between that, you know, we can't forget just because it's Boyle Heights, it's not always what they make it to be. There's a lot of tradition, a lot of culture, a lot of family-oriented uh, uh, families that are very giving of themselves. But in between that, you also have the gang subculture, right? And sometimes that tries to derail or cloudy what it is that is in existence, the culture of our traditions as Mexican, um, American, et cetera. Uh, but we also are lucky because LA is a big ass gallery. It's a studio. And you know, when you have graffiti art at play growing up in the 80s, break dancing, graffiti art, the LA River then becomes your best friend. And I think to me, those were like the kind of environments that I grew up in, being able to go to the LA River, express myself, and then come back into the housing projects and be greeted by the love of the families there and the traditions. But at the same time, you know, going up against the gang subculture. See, all those things start to shape and define and give meaning to what it is one is trying to express for me, for example, as an artist. And eventually, through my own personal discoveries and my healing and transformation, you know, after being uh, blessed to meet Father Greg, as I shared, I met him at, at the age of 10. I lived five houses down from the Lord's Mission Church. So I was kind of his neighbor at the church and going to the Lord's Mission. So it was not it was through him then that I can really embrace what it was that I was thinking of as an artist or what I wanted to become as an artist. And in that, finding my own personal healing and transformation throughout my journey through the power of the arts and every encounter that I had uh, aha moments or connections to my higher power, I said, then how can I then develop and create something that not only holds what I love to do, which is the arts, but also another thing I love to do is help people. Yeah. And then that came the vision of the Art Academy. And now the Art Academy is a place where they can come and, and, and be at ease and be at peace, at least for the time being, with hopes they can make those connections that are going to help them find their uh, confidence or re or those dreams and aspirations that they once had. And that what was done freely onto me, so it's a must that I do it, give back and pay it forward in that way. And behind the other leaders like the streetscapers, they also held me, embraced me, and, and gave me all the knowledge. So I'm just trying to give back what was freely given onto me. And the space that I'm with and the Homeboy Industries and Art Academy, it's, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful, safe, uh, heaven, uh, haven, and to me, every day I walk in, I just get uh, rejuvenated daily, daily. You know, so you know that's that's the space that I create. I, I love that. I feel so great. Yeah, rejuvenation every single day, and feel. Yeah. Um, I do want to say that I'm Mexican American. I identify as Chicana. I'm from San Diego, and I have strong ties to LA. And so to see people who I feel like I have a connection with, even from, I've never met you. But to, to know that you've gotten to this level and to be nationally recognized, it just, it, I can understand how communities back home must feel, how your communities at home must feel. Um, and I want to dig deeper into the kind of the identity and belonging topics that you've both kind of brought up. Um, being Mexican American, uh, I'm, I'm probably aging myself, but there's a quote from the Selena movie that I think everyone resonates with, like, you know, Edward James almost says as, you know, Selena's dad, you're not Mexican enough for the Mexicans, you're not American enough for the Americans, and it's exhausting. And so I think um, we create these as first or second generation Americans and third culture kids. We have to create our own traditions and we have to create our own communities sometimes. Um, and then we also speak to the legacies of our ancestors. So I, I feel like you both approach this topic very differently with your different art forms. Like you're looking at blues and jazz and country and you don't want to be labeled as just rockabilly or just country. But you're the first Latina to break the country music billboard, right? Yeah. So yeah, can we talk about these kind of issues of identity and how it shaped um, your, your artistry? Well, for me, breaking, you know, being the first Latina artist to, female to be on the country billboard charts was something that I noticed first. Like, the record label didn't make a big deal about it. And, you know, you had Freddie Fender and you had Johnny Rodriguez. And, but there hadn't been another female uh, Hispanic artist to be on the charts. And I was like, hey. That really says something for me. And then 
I noticed that a lot of fans of mine that were showing up at the different clubs would be, Rosie, why don't you sing something in Spanish? You know, and it was it was a bit of um, a challenge for me because, you know, really country music is a very white music. You know, it's it comes from, you know, down in the Kentucky hollers and. And it was, it was almost, if I did that, it was challenging because I thought, well, that's gonna hurt my career if I don't keep it, you know, twangy, you know, and I caught myself talking with the twang and everything, and I thought, that's not who I am. And I started realizing that I had to be more and more myself, so I, I got out of the Nash, Nashville scene and went with a label out of California and started rocking out more and recording a song that I wrote with a Spanish chorus and trying to find my roots. And um, because it, I realize it's important for me to carry the tradition on. So now I'm working on a record in Spanish uh, that's going to come out hopefully in the next couple of years. It's going to take a while. That's exciting. Yeah, so I'm trying to get there. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I think for me, it, it has been a little different. I think, uh, you know, if we're thinking about our ancestral lineages and those who come before us, I think it's a commitment or responsibility that we, I have, at least I made as an artist. So this has not began just overnight. I mean, there are, mar uh, it, it goes all the way back to Los Tres Grandes, mm -hmm. which uh, I say there's four Grandes, but Los Tres Grandes, Diego Rivera, Orozco, uh, and Siqueiros, I say the fourth grande is Frida Kahlo. They just didn't, they just didn't bring her in. But yeah, I appreciate that. I will also right? post. I, I think yeah. so. But either way, it goes all the way back to los tres grandes and the murals and how they were ever able to break uh, uh, barriers when folks were telling them that this imagery uh, was not acceptable. And, and etc. Diego Rivera, uh, uh, when he did the, that mural and. Um, it's in New York, I forget. The yeah, and it was removed because it had um, images of, was it, uh, the, it was somewhat political? Some the political, they broke down his mural, Siqueiros, America Tropical, out of Los Angeles, when he expressed himself and really called on the social injustice of the people. And so in that, we still experience some of that. Yeah to this day. So it's for me, they have paved the way. And later to then come and grow up in the 80s, then you have the influx of the 70s. And what that was taking place with the Brown Berets and the walkouts and the Chicano murals, uh, Chicano artists who were corresponding to those times. And in that there are there is truth. And in that there is resiliency. And in that there are still some layers of uh, that we continue to experience uh, of social injustices, but more so in the image of the gang member. Yeah. So if I can take what the Tres Grandes have put in play and Siqueiros have already uh, played out for us and really correspond on the social injustices of the image of the gang member, then that is my responsibility and duty for it is time that we also acknowledge and shine light on these human beings that the world throws away, you know, and mm -hmm. my art has allowed me to do that and bring their stories forth, for we are also part of the fabric. Right, and so that's how I'm able to continue. Also, with the new generation, right? We also got to keep in mind that the way the world is perceived now at times is a little whole lot different than what it was. But if we can't find where we came from, then we might not know where we may be going. Mm -hmm. So it is my duty to bring all that together in one place, so that we can really experience what it is and who we are, and embrace who we are, and not be ashamed of what they made us to be. No, I love that. Really, really well said. Um, I think kind of go riffing off that topic to make sure that we don't feel ashamed of who we are and the, the icons that we've been given and the misunderstandings of, of our communities and our cultures and whether or not we should be speaking a certain language <laughs> or, uh, you know, that's still happening to this day. It's still something we're struggling with. Like on the street, you might get identified and feel uncomfortable in public spaces. And so, um, this might be a strange uh, segue, but you both have very different audiences because your medium is so different. You know, Rosie, you're in a room with, with your audience and you're feeling the energy. You're speaking to them. You can see their hearts soar with every you know, note that you play. And then Fabian, you, your audience is probably the entirety of LA. You know, at any given time, someone might be interacting with your art and you, if you're not standing you know, with your murals, you know, 
So, so what are you trying to not only convey to your audiences, but how do the audience inform the work that you do? Like when you're songwriting or when you're creating, you know, the next topic for your art. Well, you want me to start, Rosa? You go first. All right. Um, <laughs> Um, I think, uh, no, that is, that, that, that is the, what makes the art, you know, it's the flavor and the people of Los Angeles, not only from my environment, but I think when I create art, I create art for all people. And, and I'm okay with taking a risk. It's a, a risk well taken to be able to paint these images that to the world might seem controversial. Yeah. That's on them though. And I think that's the invitation to invite you to come and stand before the works of art so that there we can find the humanity as, as one. That's the idea. And so to me, yeah, it is important. I think the only reason I'm able to create these beautiful images and narratives and stories is because I'm attentive to the voice of my people and community. And if I'm painting uh, with the hopes that it can be well received, then the heart don't lie. And when you paint folks, that like like for me like I shared in the video, you know there was I'll share a little story real quick, but this is what triggers it. So what, there was a 1994. I went to Central Rome, Italy, and when I went to Rome, I was 17 years old, and I stand in front of the Pieta, and the Pieta was just speaking to me. I fell into a trance with her uh, before they put the case over her, but I got to stand right near the Pieta by Michelangelo. And as I'm staring at the Pieta, I see the mother who holds her child, Jesus. But that wasn't my mother. And then I said, well, what about the mothers in my community, how they hold their children? And that's when the epiphany of thinking about the Baroque and the Renaissance art, how it's not as reflective of my community. And so to me, today, I'm going in that direction where I'm taking the Baroque and Renaissance styles work of art to really reflect my community. And sometimes, there's a lot of, uh, uh, I say this because we're up against a lot of things. Uh, trust me, even in the art world itself, you know, the labels, right? Contemporary art, Chicano art, graffiti art, prison art, sometimes those labels pigeonhole us. And at times, they don't call on us unless it's the Pacific Standard Time or, or the Hispanic Heritage Month, for example. <laughs> and I think we need to get back to the place where we reclaim the, the, the language, of, uh, the universal language of the arts. I am Chicano. Yes, but I am a contemporary artist. Mm -hmm. And once we begin to move towards that direction, just maybe, just maybe, we'll have a better opportunity to bring people together, even in the institutions. Mm -hmm. That's the mission. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. No, I, I don't even That's remember. That's a good what answer. Question. <laughs> that, was, that was great. <laughs> I could listen to him talk for hours. Yeah, I know. Speaker. And then, well, um, back to you though. I can also listen to talk talk to you for hours. Um, yeah. Do you when you're writing, what what is that process like when you're performing, when you're thinking of of new music? Um, yeah. Who's that audience, or is it just for yourself? Oh, my audience is everybody. Whoever wants to listen. Uh, I think maybe that could be part of the reason I do so many different types of music. I mean, for me, it's blues, jazz, country, rockabilly. That's kind of the thread that pulls that together is like American roots music yep. that I've learned from being a little kid growing up in San Antonio, listening to the jazz on the TV, listening to Elvis, Buddy Holly, you know, listening to Ella Fitzgerald. Uh, Nat King Cole, I just was listening to all these singers that I loved, and uh, I just listened to the songs and what they had to say, and I found that there was a yearning uh, in all of this music. It was either um, comedy to falling in love, falling out of love, uh, even children's songs. Uh, I just felt like that was a way to, to find my own art through experimenting with all the different kinds of music. And I'm, I'm still kind of experimenting with that. I'm trying to um, uh, reach out to different audiences so that they can, you know, just be entertained mm -hmm. uh, in a way that, you know, can, what can I create that they'll make them happy? Yeah. I want to create joy or I want to, you know, like a song I wrote about my father's passing, 
this song was healing for me, but if I play it for somebody and it makes them cry, it's because it makes them remember their father, you know? And so writing things, uh, playing things on the guitar that make people feel something in their heart yeah. is it important to me whether um, it doesn't matter what age group they are. Um, I'm meeting a lot of young people that are getting turned on to my music because as I'm you know, older, most of my fans are, a lot of them are senior citizens like me, but it's, it, it doesn't matter age with my music. It, age is not a, a uh, bridge, mm -hmm. uh, or the bridge isn't, there, like, it's not a wall, I mean. <laughs> uh, th there's no walls around my music. It's, it's open, it's like an ocean, and anybody can dive in you know, and dance, and maybe be influenced to write themselves, and maybe some girls will be influenced to play guitar, you know, it's just, I'm trying to kind of spread the word that, you know, you can be a woman, yeah. you can be a Chicano, uh, it doesn't matter who you are, you, if you have a dream to do something, and you believe in yourself, and you're enjoying it, then you should keep doing it so you can influence other people positively. Yeah. I mean, you're so inspiring. I am. Yeah. Rosie. Yeah. I think to, to hear you say you're still experimenting and you're still trying to, to create new boundaries to your, to your work or past those boundaries is such an inspiration. I mean, um, I guess I want to bring it, since it was Hispanic Heritage Month, I wanted to dive deep into to, um, belonging and identity, but to lighten the mood. Um, that's a beautiful guitar. <laughs> in the in, in not only the oh. photographer um, for this event, but in the film, is that your favorite guitar? Can I ask more about? It that? is my favorite guitar. <laughs> yeah. um, it it's a Telecaster shaped body. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the Telecaster was uh, designed by Leo Fender at Fender Guitars, and it, it goes way back. A lot of uh, country players have used it. But there's something about the tone in it uh, that works really well for blues as well. Um, I don't play jazz guitar, I only sing. But um, that guitar was made by a French guitar maker uh, named James Trussart, uh, who grew up in Nancy, France. And um, it's just the way this man builds guitars, the electronics, the pickups that are in it, um, the way they make their necks. Um, there's a lot of metal in the guitar. It's, it's called a steel top caster. And um, it's been hollowed out in the wood part of it so that it'll be a little bit lighter to carry and play. But um, I helped design the front of it by, I said, put a red star on it. You know, I wanted to have my favorite colors together, turquoise and red. and. Um, so that guitar has been with me for about eight years. And uh, I do have 10 guitars all together. So sometimes I uh, bring other guitars on the road mm -hmm. because it's not as heavy, okay. you know. So, but yeah, it's a great guitar. I mean, that sounds like incredible craftsmanship. And it's, it's really amazing. cool looking. I'm sorry, you're inspiring me to pick up a guitar. Pick it up. I am not. I'll give you a free lesson. Oh, I'm. <laughs> It's on the library's website forever, so um, we heard it here first. Another, like, kind of same, same question. Do you have any idiosyncrasies about your work? Anything that would be surprising for someone to know about your, your art form? No, I think uh, uh, the only thing I can share is that uh, th 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 I've been focusing more on uh, themes and bodies of work. And when I think about bodies of work, I was taught by uh, uh, Vincent Valdez, who is a Chicano artist out of San Antonio, Texas. That's my other mentor. And he said, you know, Fabian, I think you have a beautiful story, but how do you break it, it, break it into themes and, and bodies of work? And I think that's how the museums and galleries and other folks might correspond more to your work, you know, if that's the direction you want to go. But in the end of the day, I only paint from my heart. And wherever it goes, that's where it goes. You know, in the end of the day, but I think this year has been a great year for me. Uh, I did a body of work called Cara de Vago, which is taking Caravaggio influence and, and the Renaissance Baroque 
style work of art, and I did a series called Cara de Vago. And in Cara de Vago, there's 13 paintings beautifully framed as if they were something out of the National History Museum of, of Art here or something, you know? And they looked amazing, and I had a beautiful exhibit around that, and, and, and it was promising, it hit followed by another body of work in this year, which is called Love Letters. And Love Letters was where I took 10 homeboys and homegirls, formerly incarcerated, who, I made, who have made an impact in my life, and paint them in presidential style portraits. Mm -hmm. And presidential style portraits, which to me was a beautiful approach, because you know when I walk through some of these buildings here uh, uh, in DC or in museums, you see these beautiful presidential style portraits. And then I say, why can't my homies be those presidents, right? And so I did paint them in that style, and that in itself was a hit as well. That's still brewing. So now when I return, I have a 52 feet scale mural to be installed. So I will be installing that in the third week of October. And it's planted right in the heart of my city, which is Boyle Heights. Wow. And so to me, that big mural is gonna be a great one. And so that's after this, when I get back, you'll, the next thing is that large scale mural. So I, I just say all that to say that it's all about consistency, commitment, and responsibility. And I think, you know, when I leave this earth, I just wanna make sure that my children can read up on me and be proud of me and recognize that their daddy made a major impact to making the world a safer place. I think um, we can't under understate how much of an impact you both have made um, in um, you know American art forms in general, and we're so happy to have you as as fellows. Um, can I ask for time if we there's time for Q and A? Um, yeah, would you like to to take some questions, or do you want to riff up here? That's all right. Yeah. Unless anyone got questions. Okay. Oh, sorry. I wanted to ask you, Fabian, if you have a book of your work. Actually, that, that is not, not it's, it's in the making here, but I haven't really put, published uh, a full book of my artwork. It's not quite there yet. But I do have a book called Love Letters that it's available on my website that you can purchase. And it holds all the artwork of the 10 homies I just described, their love letters mm -hmm. and their stories. FabianDevora.com. <laughs> I'll give it to you after. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions? Thank you. Hi, I have a question for Fabian. Um, I, oh, uh, well, mainstream lens usually shows spirituality as a very personal thing, but at the, in the video at Homeboy Industries, I noticed you sharing sacred smoke with community. So I was wondering if you could speak on that, um, especially like spirituality, community. Um, you mentioned rejuvenating every day. Um, what else? Yeah, just pretty much. No, no, yeah, I think you know all those layers in the academy have uh, all stemmed from my personal lived experience, and everything that I bring forth in that is something that I've had experienced and discovered in ways that they were given to me. So when I bring in the indigenous uh, practices, they were given to me by my elder Turtle Hawk, who is from the Shumash, and he's the one who gave me the permission to be able to practice uh, some of these native uh, uh, teachings, right, which also ignite spirit and hold spirit sacredly. And I think that in itself is an introduction to the young men and women that we work with because sometimes and somehow that has been disconnected. And if we bring back their culture, indigenous practices, then they're going to tap into the, the memory and the DNA. And when they do, then they reclaim their values, right? In a sense, that's why I utilize that. And spirituality is key. Because once we start to get involved and talk about religion, we create a divide. But if we just stay amongst the lines of spirituality, then the spirit feels its worth without creating a divide. And that's why I focus it. And it's okay, because Father Greg, being that he is of, of Catholic, 
He never did once question what it is we bring forth into Homeboy Industries. Father Greg always said to me, it doesn't matter, as long as we find our transformation, whether it's through the help of the Virgin Mary, so be it. And if it's Jesus, so be it. And if it's the Red Road, more power to you. If it's Buddha, that's okay too. And the end of the day, it's about finding your way and your own personal healing and transformation through whatever spiritual concept it is that works for you. And that's okay. I wanted to direct this question at Rosie Flores. She's been such a huge uh, influence on young girls that play guitar and uh, write songs. And can you tell us a little bit how you really championed the women before you? you... Well, uh, I hope that I championed some women before me. Do you mean mentored? And well, I'm not sure what cha well, you championed means. Wanda Jackson, uh, you know these these women that you really helped them oh, I lift see. their voices. Oh yeah. Uh, well, Janice Martin. So it's it's good that you mentioned Janice Martin and Wanda Jackson because they were rockabilly women that that were the first rock and roll women that came out around the Elvis in the 1950s. Burnett Brothers, um, you know, Gene Vincent, all the, you know, the early rock and roll guys. There were a few women that were out there that were influencing the music scene. And uh, Elvis got wanted a rock. And so I listened to a lot of her recordings and uh, I wanted to sound like her. And so when I got a chance to meet her and sing backgrounds for her, um, I became friends with her, and I, I asked her if we could record some songs together. And so I took her into the studio and produced a couple songs for my Rockabilly Philly record. And um, same thing with Janice Martin, who was known as the female Elvis. I got to know her and asked her if I could produce a couple songs for her for the Rockabilly Philly record. So I ended up making really good friends with these women that were my idols that were kind of like the three guys that helped you, the muralists. What were they called? The three? The Tres Grandes. The Tres Grandes. <laughs> yeah. So when you, you find people that, that were like masters to you, and they were like the masters to me, so I thought they should be brought back out again. Uh, they were like hiding underneath blankets, and they weren't performing anymore. So I, I took them on tour, and um, Janice uh, didn't really want to go on tour, but I produced her last record. And um, unfortunately, she got cancer right when the record was finished, so she never got to see it come out. But I raised money on the Kickstarter campaign for her, and we got the record out, um, and uh, still selling. And uh, it's a great record, and it's very rewarding for me that I got a chance to give her a last record before she passed, because she hadn't recorded for 30 years. And um, it's a great record. And um, so I think the fact that I did that for a couple of women like them that were greatly adored by so many other uh, rockabilly fans, men and women in the scene, that it kind of brought my name up and gave me a little more notoriety. So that's how I met a lot of different artists that wanted to meet me and you know, work with me, take guitar lessons from me, and, and come to my shows and things like that. It kind of spreads like wildfire when you help one person that it's just like a link in a chain, I think, if that answers. Thank you. Um, I want to speak about the longevity of your mur murals. Um, when a Tibetan monk creates a mandala, it's uh, swept away soon after it's finished, or a sidewalk artist will do, do a trick of the eye uh, drawing on a sidewalk, and it's only there until the first rains come along. I was wondering, um, how painful it is to see your murals uh, fade or be um, painted over 
Is there, is there an average longevity to one of your murals, or do you apply um, any kind of uh, glazes or things to diffuse Absolutely. the light or protect the colors in the long term? Absolutely, I think, uh, and also you gotta make sure uh, that you're, you're passing on your skill set, right? So not only is it Fabian, but I do have an art gang. I have like Jesse Fregroso. I have other team players that understand my process. So in case the day comes, they have to come back and preserve. They, lo they know my, my approach. But more than so, it's important uh, accordingly to make longevity on these murals. So the paint that I use is called Nova Color. And Nova Color paint, it's out of uh, 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 Culver City in Los Angeles. They're known for, for the high-end paint that you use for muralism. That's one. Also, uh, it all depends on, and they have everything one needs to preserve a mural. So the paint itself gives you t uh, 10 years guaranteed before discoloration. But it's also how many layers of gloss or clear PVC, some projector you apply. That reflects away from discoloring the actual paint. So they will last up to 15 to 20 years before you have to be called back to touch them up. And that's because of the high-end quality paint that we utilize today. And so also, uh, depending on the project too, right? You know, like if I'm going to do something that's going to be uh, just temporary, I'm not going to give it my all. <laughs> but if I'm going to be doing something that's going to live for a long time, I'm going to give it my all and some. And that's just the way I work because, you know, art is not just something to entertain. It's a way of life. It comes from spirit and, and needs to be preserved as long as it can. <laughs> yeah. um, I just want to ask Rosie, um, you know, when you started your career, it was in a time where like women didn't have a voice and it was a real struggle for women and even being a woman and growing up in a male um, subculture was really hard and you know, just imagine like how it was for you, like how were your struggles and how did you overcome come them and like what advice would you give to like other women that had to face like those kind of struggles that you had? Yeah, it, it was, Interesting to be, you know, in in uh, in the '60s, when you know after the, after the Beatles were popular, all these boys had bands, and there wasn't any females that were doing it. But my brother was in a band, and so I would hang out with him and watch them. And because I'd been singing since I was six, I asked him if I could sing with them, and I realized how much of a thrill I got from that. And so because I was able to be around my brother's friends uh, who liked me because I was his little sister and um, because they, were, they wanted to help me uh, do it, I kind of felt like there, there shouldn't be any kind of a uh, tension between having men around me and that I, I so here, try this the guitar, you know, let me teach you some chords. And I, it, they brought me into their guy club. And so it made it easier for me to be around the, maybe the remarks that you might get from guys that were like, oh, you're a girl playing guitar? It was like, I didn't mind that because I already had confidence from playing around my brother's friends. So I never really felt too much struggle other than I think that you know, it, it is a man's world out in the music business and maybe a lot of places in the world uh, through business. You know, I was watching, like, how come male actors, for instance, get paid way more than the female actors? And, you know, I started noticing and, you know, finding my friends that were in business, how come the businessmen are getting paid more than the women? And so I started thinking, wow, that's probably also in the music business. And I noticed that there were a lot more men that were being signed than women. So that's where the struggle was. And um, so I just kept moving forward and uh, trying to you know, put out positive vibrations. Like if, if some guy would say, you're pretty good for a girl, I would say, well, thank you. Instead of, what do you mean? You know, I would just, instead of creating tension, create positivity around the remarks that might 
be challenging to me. And um, I don't know if I, I got that from my mom, but um, she was very much positive like that, you know, and turning things around so that you could always try to communicate with people better rather than having tension about, well, I don't agree with what you say, so what do you mean? You know, let's fight about it. And it was like, no, that's not going to get you anywhere. It's, it's better to try and communicate uh, musically and share. And so I love working with men. Um, I have all men in my band right now. And I love working with women, too. Uh, my friend Penny over there is a female musician, and she has a female group. And I love jumping up on stage with them and playing guitar and feeling the female camaraderie. Uh, so I really live in two different worlds. And um, I've had a lot of female bands from Penelope's Children, my first all-girl band when I was 16, and the Screaming Sirens, my punk rock band out of LA when I was in my early 30s, and Hen House, my Texas band, with Cindy Cashdollar and Lisa Pankratz and Sarah Brown and Marsha Ball. So uh, I'm hoping that you know, if any any guys are seeing this, that they'll learn to um, respect more women musicians and open their doors, and you know, not be not be afraid to let women join their band because there, we women have a lot to offer musically, uh, wordsmith wise, and um, we're we're a barrel of laughs if you give us a chance. <laughs> it's fun, fun to hang out with. <laughs> You're so cool. <laughs> I love that. Um, the stories, I, I want to hear about the stories you must have. Well, I'm writing a book, so Ooh. <laughs> Okay, keep an eye out. Um, I think we have one more question. Okay. Hi, um, this is a question for both of you. You've both been in your careers for such a long time. Um, so I'd love to hear about how you see the significance of your art changing over the course of your careers, if you do. Um, I think it's it's not changing. I, it, no, it's just getting better. I think it's changing, but it's it really isn't. I think uh, I guess what the way I see that things are changing is that um, my mastery in painting. You know, I am a master painter. I'm a self-taught artist. I never had a formal education. It is just through my own passion and willingness to discover, learn, and experiment that I got to where I'm at now. And I think the only thing that is changing is, uh, is the imagery and how I'm conveying the message and correspondence to the generations of today. Uh, for the voices of yesterday, you can hear the screams, but they're not received as they are. Uh, they're not received as they were at one point. So I say that to say that the story and the narratives are now informing my work of art that is really corresponding to the generations of today and the social injustices that we're facing, as well as what is the hope and the resiliency that is also being signified from the young people that I work with. And I think that is the only thing that is influencing and, and shifting and, and the approach that I do my artwork. That sounds right. and. I, as far as changing, um, I think what you said is very true about just getting better and growing. And um, like I said, I want I want to record it. I have an idea for a song, not a song, an album that's going to be bilingual in Spanish. And uh, I want to be able to bring more people to my music through the cultura and. Uh, through LA and uh, Austin and Spain, you know, and all, all the Spanish speaking uh, cultures out there that have never heard my music. I think I can reach a wider audience. And um, I, for me, I just feel like I need to keep practicing the guitar all the time. There's so much to learn. Um, I have to keep that neck in my hand every morning with coffee. And when I do, it's, you know, it's bringing more and more ideas. Uh, I get song melodies. It's easier to write more songs. Um, keep a pen in your hand and keep writing. Uh, it's just growing. And we'll see what happens down the road. You know, I, I don't really know what's going to come because 
it's like your subconscious brings it to you and all the people that you meet and uh, the movies that you see, the books that you read, uh, bring more influence into my heart. And it's, it's like, okay, I'm gonna express uh, what's going on in the world and the people I meet. If I fall in love, I fall out of love. You know, it's just gonna bring more and more creativity. So we'll see what the future brings. If I can live long enough, I'll tell lots of stories. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much. I've only known you both a very short amount of time, yeah. but I'm really just, you know, kind of blown away, not only by your fortitude, which we've discussed today, but your like lightness and your humor. You both have made me laugh quite a bit. And um, thank you for bringing your art and that energy into the world. We, like, we all very much appreciate it. And I want to congratulate you on being uh, NEA Heritage Fellows from, you know, everyone here. Congratulations. Um, I love it. So thank you so much. I think, um, I think that's a wrap, no? Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for coming.